29th, we'll have programs to help explore your inner hero. It's not too late to register for some of reading. And when you do, we'll tell you how to find our real life heroes and get a lucky star for yourself. And now, Tracy Yardley is a comic book artist best known for Sonic the Hedgehog comic series published by Archie Comics. He is also serving as main artist for the new side series called Sonic Universe. An Illinois native, Mr. Yardley has been interested in comics for most of his life. He's a graduate of the Savannah College of Art and Design, and the best thing is, he now lives in Georgia. So please, let's welcome Tracy Yardley. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming out today. If you kids want to scoot up just a little bit, you can. And you guys on the side, so scoot in a little bit more. That way you can see really well. I'm a fan. So let's, let's all give a big hand to Book Woman. We want to thank them all for, for providing us with this opportunity for all these fun things that we do here in the summer at the library. So as you, as you, were, you just heard, my name is Tracy Yardley. I do spell that with an exclamation point, so if you want, you could say my name, Tracy Yardley! Oh, but you don't have to, that's okay. <laughs> I just like to spell it that way. And as she said, our, uh, our, our theme this summer is every hero has a story. And so that's my job. I draw comic books about heroes, and I get to tell their stories. That's a pretty cool job, huh? You guys think you'd like to do that? Yeah. Yeah, does anybody here like to draw? Uh, yeah. Does anybody, like, does anybody like to read comic books? Yeah, very cool. Reading comic books is a great way to start out reading when you're young, because, you know, as I'll tell you more about later, it's, it's a great uh, medium that involves words and pictures. Not just, just, not just words like out in the library. So it helps you get started with a fun way to read. And uh, you can read all about heroes, like, what do we think of when we think of heroes? What kind of things do heroes wear? That's right. We think about capes or masks. We think about guys that fly around and have superpowers. But this young fellow just said it too. In the real world, we have the military. We have police and firemen, and maybe even your mom and dad and your teachers at school. All of those people can be heroes. We don't have to have superpowers to be heroes. And everybody, even people in real life and heroes in comic books, we all have our stories. And we can read about that in, in comic books and in books out in the library there. Now, I'm sure you guys heard, obviously. We all know who this is, right? Sonic, Sonic the Hedgehog. That's one of the heroes that I draw. You can see some nice cool pictures over there that, that, that some of the kids have called in about Sonic the Hedgehog. I've been working, uh, as you were told, on Sonic the Hedgehog. I've been doing this comic book for about 10 years. And uh, over that time, I've drawn over 100 issues of comic books. And that, that's more than 2,000 pages of comic books. It's a lot of work, right? It's a lot of time. But it's still, it's still a fun job. But you got to remember that it's not all fun and games. It's not all of just fun and drawing. It's, it's, it's a lot of work that goes into these books. And I'll tell you some more about that in a little bit. Now, I, like I said, I've drawn him quite a few times. Sometimes I, I kind of forget how to draw all the little details. And I want you guys to help me out and uh, help me remember exactly how we draw Sonic. So everything that we draw usually starts out with shapes, right? So his head is kind of a, a circle shape, right? That's basically what his head looks like, right? No, no, it's fine. Well, it starts off like that, right? And then he's got that, that peach muzzle here, you know. I kind of think that looks like a jelly bean. It's kind of the shape of a jelly bean. That's what I usually think of. And then his nose. That's kind of like a jelly bean, too, right? <laughs> Does Sonic have one eye or two eyes? How many eyes does he have? Well, he's got two eyes, but they are kind of like one, right? You get that one big eye. Isn't that kind of weird? Yeah. So we've got his eyes there. And he's got that 
you know, the, the ridge over his eyes, the eyebrow there. This isn't the best drawing, but uh, see, he's got ears, doesn't he? How many ears? Yeah, what, what shape are they? I, that's right, I see it over there. They're triangles, aren't they? That's right. He's got the two triangle ears. And uh, he's a hedgehog, right? So what's he got on, his, on the back of his head? How many spikes has he got? How many we got? I heard someone say it. there's three, right? There you go, three big spikes on the back of his head. They're sharp. He's a hedgehog, you gotta watch out. And there's his eyes. Again, just a quick drawing. And he's smiling, because he's got a good attitude. He's a hero, he's a good guy. He's got Sonic the Hedgehog. That was pretty quick, right? That was a quick and easy drawing of Sonic. No, you're right. I didn't know his whole body yet, but that's just the same there. And that took, you know, that didn't take a lot of time. But I've drawn him many, many times. It took me a lot of practice to be able to draw him that quickly and easily. So that's something that's really important to remember, is that drawing takes a lot of practice to really get good at it. Now, that was Sonic. And I work on some other heroes, too. You can tell me what I'm drawing here. Just a real quick little drawing. Well, it could be Batman. Yeah, it's a cat. You know, we got to remember all the stuff that cats have. They got their eyes, and they got their cat nose and their little mouth. We got some whiskers. Right? That's just a quick drawing of a cat. Who can tell me what that says right there? I got a hero cat right there in the name, isn't it? Hero cats. Those cats are heroes. Do they have capes? Do they have masks? No, no, they don't have all that stuff. But they are heroes. They have powers. Well, maybe, do they have powers? We'll, see, we'll find out about that. I'm going to tell you about these hero cats here real quick. This is Cassiopeia. She has a, a power that most cats don't have. We wouldn't think of it as a superpower, but for a cat, it's pretty special. She has the power to read. So, if there's something going on in the town, she can read about it in the newspaper or on the news. And she can read the street signs or read a map to help the cats get around town and help stop cross when it starts up. This is Ace. He, he was owned by a military family, some of those real life heroes that we talked about. And he learned about tactics and plans from his military owner. So he, he makes the plans whenever the bad guys are causing trouble. This is Rocco. You see Rocco's a pretty big cat there. He's tough. He's been in a scrape or two in his day. You can see kind of part of his ears can shoot off there. But he almost never loses a fight. So if something's going wrong, you know, Rocco's going to be there to help out. This is Midnight. We all know who Batman is, right? We've heard of Batman, right? Yeah. Midnight is kind of like Batman. He's dark. He's brooding. He hates those criminals, and he really hates crime. So he's going to do whatever it takes to help keep the city safe. This is Rocket. You can see by his name and by how he's running there, he's really fast. He runs really fast. But he's also kind of crazy. He thinks he's from outer space. So he's not all there, but he's pretty fun to have around. And this is Belle. She's the last one there, but she actually does have a superpower. She can read minds, which is really useful too. So if somebody's causing some trouble and they're not sure what's going on, all she has to do is take a look at him, and she can tell the other cats if they're a bad guy, or a good guy. And now those are the hero cats. They live in the city, it says right here, of Stellar City. That's the city they live in. And they all got together and they, they decided that they should do things to keep their city safe. You know, they took it upon themselves to be heroes. So, but they're not the only heroes in Stellar City. I want you guys to read, what does this say? Cosmic Girl, okay. Now, these are the big superheroes of Stellar City. What are they wearing? Snacks, capes, tights. You know, they like to show off their muscles, just like those heroes, those superheroes always like to do. Whenever something's really going bad and there's some big trouble that the kitty cats can't handle, these two guys step in and save the day. And now, like we said, every, every hero has a story. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about their story later on. And when we do that, I want you guys to help me shout out their names, because these are the big time heroes right here. So when we get to our story later on, I'm going to hold up my fist like this. And when I do that, the boys are going to say, 
Galaxy Man. We gotta practice that right now, okay, you guys? You gotta help me, boys, right? Ready? Galaxy Man. And girls, when I do that, what's this one? Cosmic Girl, right? So we say Galaxy Man, and then girls, come on, let's hear it. Cosmic Girl. So we'll hear. We'll hear more about these heroes later on. We'll we'll tell you their story in a little while. Okay. So. Now, as I've told you before, this is my job. This is what I do for a living. And I'll tell you a little bit about the kind of comic books are made. Do you think it's all just me making these comic books? No. I mean, I do, I do part of the job, but it's not just me. It takes a whole team of people, and there's a whole lot of work that goes into it. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. First, you have a guy called, the, or a girl called the editor. That's the person who's at the top of the food chain. They're the boss. They hire the artists. They, uh, they tell me if my work is looking good or if maybe I should make some changes. And they tell me when I need to get things done on time. It's kind of like a parent, you know? When your parent says, you better have those chores done. By the time I get home, the editor's there to say, you got to have those pages done by next Thursday. The book's going to be late. So that's his job. He keeps things on track. And on time. The next person is the writer. That's right. Just like those books out there in the library that you read, comic books start off as written down words on a script, like this. A lot of words, huh? A whole lot of words going on there. And that is so the, all the ideas that the writer comes up with are put down on paper so that me or somebody else can understand exactly what he's thinking of, down to the detail. So we need to have the script, so the ideas are on paper. And then it's my job comes next. I am what's called a pencil. Excuse my handwriting. What do you think I use to do my job? A pencil. I write a pencil. Pretty complicated, huh? Well, what I, what I do is pencils. So it's my job to take that script and I'll think about it on the paper, and I'll make a little drawing based on the words, and I'll, I'll lay out just a basic outline, and I'll make sure that there's room for the words and all the pictures and stuff. So I gotta take these words, and I gotta translate them into pictures. These are some pencil pages. These are from the, uh, the first issue of The Adventures of Galaxy and Cosmic World. So we see here, we have, uh, you know, we have a bad guy here, and he's making these dinosaur bones all come to life, right? And then Galaxy Man is flying overhead, and he sees that there's some trouble, so he comes down and he's going to take care of business, right? Did you draw them? I did. These are pages that I penciled. This is your standard comic book page. It's 11 by 14. And then you can see it has the little blue lines on the outside. It tells you how big to make the pictures and not to go outside those lines. They'll get cut off when it gets printed. So those are pencil pages. They're not done yet, right? Not all the way done just yet. The next step after that is the inker. Those pages were pencil. These pages are inked. These are some pages from a Sonic the Hedgehog comic book that I drew. And then somebody else came on top of those pencils and they put ink on top. That way it can't be changed, it can't be erased anymore. It's finished and it's ready to go on to the next step. These are final ink pages. That's just what you see printed in the comic books. But something's missing. What do you not see here? Color. Color. Anything else you don't see? Somebody said it's words. There's no words there. And that's another important point when you're drawing comic books is that you have to leave room for the words. You see these big open spaces I've left here and there? That's room for the word boys. Because if I filled up the page with really important artwork all over the page, there'd be no space for the words. And they'd have to cover up something important. So always make sure that you leave room for your words. So that's, that's what you call the ink pages. And then, of course, as I just said, we have the letter. 
and the colorist. So that's a lot of people. What do we got? One, two, three, four, five, six different people there working as a team to make these comic books happen every month. And that doesn't include the publishers, the printers, the graphic design people that put the covers and all the logos and stuff and all the ads together in a book. And then you have the people that distribute it and mail it out. So it's a big business, a lot of stuff's going on. So next time you pick up a little comic book like this, remember that a whole lot of work when you're leaving that and bringing it to you every month. So there's a lot of stuff there. Lots to remember, I know. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I make my comic books. One of the things I like to talk about is that comics don't have to be really complicated. It's, a, it's something that everybody can do. It doesn't take a lot of fancy, expensive equipment. I told you before, what do I use? A pencil. Just like the pencils you guys have. Nothing to it. Just, just a regular old pencil. And then what do we think whenever you make a mistake and use a what? Eraser. Eraser, of course. You guys ain't erasers at school, right? They're usually pink. And they get that dust everywhere when you erase something. You gotta, you gotta get it out of the way. This is, this is what you call a kneaded eraser. This is made of rubber, just like your erasers at school, but it's been kneaded. It's just spelled K-N-E-A-D-E-D, -E -E just like dough that you need. This has been kneaded so that you can stretch it. Just like silly putty, right? So whenever you get, when the eggs get all dirty and full of lead, you can just kind of stretch it out and smoosh it around and get a cleaner spot to work with. And I like it too because you can, you can smoosh it into a little point and make a small erase, or you can smash it big and get a big spot all over. So that's a needed eraser. That's the kind of eraser I like to use. When I was a kid, I used to think it was kind of like cheating to use a ruler to get a really straight line, right? But nobody can draw a perfectly straight line all the time, or if at all. So this is a triangle, and it has straight edges, of course, so you can use that. You can get nice right angles, or you know, these angles, or straight lines. You can do inside. So you could, absolutely. This is a circle template. If you need to draw all kinds of different sizes of circles, you see, you just find the one you want, and you can use that. And this is what you call a French curve. There's lots of different curves on it that you can really find and line up your pencil to run along there or your, pen, your pens with your ink. Like if I wanted to get a nice smooth line here, you know, I could match it up and then run my pencil or pen along that line and get a nice smooth curve. And it makes it nice and easy. And I use different kinds of pens. Um, some of the ink that you saw, there's a fellow named Jim Amish that works on my pages a lot. He still uses a brush and a little pot of ink, just like they did in the olden days. He doesn't use a, an eagle quill feather pen, but uh, he uses a brush and inks. And I use these kind of pens here that have different size nibs on them there. Just a felt tip pen. All of these things, these are what I like to use. You guys don't have to use this kind of pen. You don't have to use that kind of paper. You can use whatever you like, whatever works best for you. And you can find all of these <coughs> kind of things at an art supply store like AC Moore or Michaels or whatever. None of it's terribly expensive and you can find it all over the place. And you can use those things to make your own comics. You don't have to have a really fancy computer and all kinds of equipment. But when you do see nowadays like these kind of images, these covers, these are colored on computers using a program called Adobe Photoshop. And that is very expensive, but you don't have to have it. You can do it with markers like in the old days. That's how they used to color all the comics in markers, or you can paint them. Or you can just leave it black and white. It doesn't have to have color. So, those are some of the tools that we use. But again, you can use whatever you like. So, as I've told you before, I've been doing this for a long time. And, uh, you know, even when I was a kid, just like you guys, I used to like to draw all the time. So when I was in middle school and high school, I took all the art classes they had, and I went to art college at the Savannah College of Art and Design, which is a very expensive, really neat school. So I always like to tell people that you don't have to have a degree to do comic books. I think that everyone should get some kind of degree, because it's very important to have higher education. But if you want to do comics, you don't have to have a degree or a resume. You have to be able to draw comics. And that takes a lot of years of practice. I've been practicing at this for over 20, 25 years. So I'm going to show you guys a few little tricks about drawing that I like to share. 
When I was in high school, my teacher used to tell me that the key to good drawing is observation. Can anybody tell me what observation is? Yes. Um, watching and learning. Well, watching and learning, that's a good way to put it. What I like to think about as is, yeah, is looking really closely and thinking about what you're looking at and paying close attention to the details. So, here's my little uh, example. Somebody says, draw me a cup, right? Well, let's draw a cup. That looks like a cup, right? Does that look like a cup? No. No? Yeah, well, that's fine. <laughs> You know, that's the basic shape of a cup, isn't it? There you go. But if we observe it, we look really closely at it, that's not exactly what a cup looks like. It's, what do we see when we look at it this way? Three. Well, yeah, it is in three dimensional. And we, three dimensions, and we see a circle this way. But if we look at it like we would normally, if we were drinking out of it, looking at it this way, what shape is it now? Can you tell me? A circle. Well, not so quite a circle. Cylinder. What I mean is on the top of the cup here, when we look at it closely, from a particular angle, it's an oval, right? From that angle, it looks like an oval. Even though this way it's a circle, things change when you look at them from different perspectives. So you have to pay attention to what you're really seeing rather than what you think you're seeing. That's the key to observation. It's taking what you're seeing and trying to reproduce it on paper. So of course we have the sides that go down. And on the bottom, yes, we have a curve like a cylinder. But there's even more to this cup if we look and observe it closely. We got these little ridges right here, right? And there's one down at the bottom. So there's more to this cup than we, you know, at first think. Now that's just a real quick drawing. But that's what we talk about when we talk about observation. Here's another thing that we, we don't want to just jump to what we admit, initially think of in our mind. If somebody asks you to draw a chair, right? Let's say, here's a chair. Well, that looks kind of like a chair, doesn't it? We got, our, yeah, we got our back and the legs and the seat, don't we? But look behind you at those chairs back there. There's a lot more going on with these chairs, aren't there? If we were to look at it and draw it, you know, we got the seat back here. I'm not going to draw maybe the whole thing. But we got that and what? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, um, sticks coming out of the back of it here. So we got you know six of those, and we got the little curved back, and we got the legs. There's four, the four legs, and they each have a little crossbar going across here. Now that's a quick drawing, but there's a lot more detail there than this, isn't there? Because we observed and we looked at it closely, and we thought about what we were drawing. So that's important to remember. Why is it important? Well, when you're drawing a comic book, there's a lot more than just Sonic the Hedgehog on the page, or Superman, or whoever. They have to inhabit a world, right? If uh, Superman is having a fight with a villain in downtown Metropolis, he's going to have to draw buildings, draw cars, all the other people, fire hydrants, traffic lights, street signs, all that stuff. If we were to draw a comic about us here in the library, we'd have to be able to draw all these lights, and these walls with their angles, and all you kids here on the floor. So, drawing comic books is not just about drawing your favorite character. It's about drawing all kinds of stuff. And so when I talk about practicing for a lot of years, what I used to do in college, the most important thing I had was a sketchbook. And we were told to fill that up every day, do at least five pages every day of whatever you see. Dogs, cats, buildings, cars, plants, tables, chairs, forks, knives, all that stuff. You never know what might turn up in the script for a comic book. Now, you don't have to remember all of that at once. But it's really important to have you know, a good understanding of how to draw a wide variety of things. And right now, you guys see that you have some paper there in front of you. We're going to do a quick little exercise. I want you guys to pick out something right near around you. You can draw your shoe, or you can draw your neighbor, or you can draw your hand. Or if you got a phone or some other gadget, you can draw that. Or you can pick up, you know, anything you see here in the room. And I want you to really observe it closely. I want you guys to really pay attention to all the little details. And then we're going to draw that room. Okay, 
So that's, that's one of the things that is really important to memorize and to practice on is your hand. We start with our hand. Your, your palm is kind of a square shape, basically, right? And our fingers start as cylinders. Can you guys all see that? So we have cylinders. How many joints do we have in our fingers? Three, right? How many fingers do we have? Of course, we have four. Well, five counting the thumb. Start off with these cylinders here. And then you look at your fingers, guys. Are they all the same length? No. No, they're not. Your middle finger is the longest, and then they get shorter on either side. And I took that into account here. So when you're drawing your fingers, and you can, you can break out these cylinders here, and then you look at your fingers, and what do we have? We have a fingernail, and we have these little little ridges here on our knuckles so we can draw those sorts of things. That's, as I said before, where observation really comes in. You've got to pay attention to those details about the rate of your fingers and all that sort of stuff. So those are the things that we need to do when we're practicing to draw. Because as I said, this is my job. It's my business. There's a lot of people counting on me getting stuff done quickly on time. So I can't always, I can't always go and find a picture. I have to remember some things. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about comic books in general. <laughs> like if you go to a mechanic shop or an electronics place, they're going to have all kinds of terms for all the stuff that they use and all the things they do. We have terms that we use for comic books too. If you guys can look up here, what shapes do we see? What shapes are these things made out of? Absolutely. These are all rectangles and squares. And what I call this is a grid panel layout. I call it a grid because everything is straight up and down, sideways. Kind of boring, but it's really straightforward. Just like you read a book, right? Left to right and up to down. You don't have to think too hard about it. It's easy to follow. You see that word right there, panel, which I've mentioned a few times, I think. Some of the terms we use. All of these shapes that have the pictures inside them, that's what we call panels. It's like in a comic book, or just like these over here. Those are called panels. That's what has the pictures inside of it. These blue lines here, there's nothing there. That's what we call the gutter. It's like when you're bowling, and you throw it on the side, there's nothing there, you don't hit anything. That's the gutter. There's nothing there. It's just in between. When you see a box like this, if, not, if somebody's not talking, and it gives you narration. We call it a text box. Pretty fancy, I know. You know, when it says, meanwhile, or on the other side of town, that's a text box. You see these shapes that come out of people's mouths and have the words in it. When somebody's talking directly, we refer to that as a word balloon. Again, that's another really fancy term. But that's a word balloon. <laughs> this is what I call a dynamic panel layout. Dynamic means there's 
lots happening. There's stuff going on in all directions and action. So are these these aren't all squares or rectangles, are they? Some of them are. But you see, these first three are all kind of trapezoid shapes, right? And we got the little wing breaking over there. And this one is sandwiched right in between those other panels. And these are all overlapping. There's stuff breaking out of the borders. So we use the dynamic panels to show that action is happening and there's stuff going on. It automatically tells you that this is an exciting action page, not just a, a grid layout. <coughs> So as I told you guys before, there's a lot that goes into these, these pages, right? Do you see this page here? This is a page of pencils I showed you before. How long do you think it took me to draw that page? Well, not quite two days, no. It took me, me about four hours to draw this one page. Now, that's pretty quick. That's pretty fast for a comic book artist. There's a lot of stuff going on there, right? So. Um, that's just one page, <clears throat> and a comic book like this has about 20 pages in it. So we'll do that math right there. 20 pages at four hours a page, that's about 80 hours worth of work. Now you adults here can tell your kids, 40 hours is your typical work week. So it takes me about two weeks worth of work to make one comic book. That most people will sit down and read through in about 20 minutes. So, a lot of work goes in. That's why we practice and that's why we gotta get fast at drawing. It's really important about comics. So, you know, <laughs> I've told you a whole lot right there about how comics are made and how I make them as a cartoon. And I'll tell you why I make comics. I make comics because they're fun. You guys like to read comics, you say, right? Well, I like to draw comics because it's fun to tell stories, right? Now, um, <clears throat> as I showed you before, you see these little comic books right here? These are some I made before I was a professional. This size, this comic, this paper right here, is just the same kind of paper that you guys have on the floor. This is just made out of typing paper. It's been cut down a little bit, folded and stapled over. You know, we had these printed at a local print shop. You know, I did the color cover, sure, but you know, all the interior is black and white. So, before I was a professional, I used to work at gas station during the day, and I would draw comic books at night. And as I said, there aren't any resumes or job interviews in the comic book business. When you, want, when you talk to an editor or some other professional, this is your resume right here. If you want to be a professional comic book artist, do not wait for someone to give you a job drawing comics because they never will. You have to draw your own comics and prove that you know how to do it. You have to know how to tell a story. With those panels that I described, you got to be able to show that you can draw a lot of stuff in a short amount of time because it's a business and it's, a, and it's important to be quick. And what's really fun though, what's really fun about comics as those panels and those layouts they showed you, everybody understands comics, right? Everybody likes comics. I'm going to show you this. This is a comic book from Japan. This was made in Japan. It's about a video game, but it was made in Japan. And I want you guys to take a look at some of the artwork in here. You know, we have the panels, right? Different shaped panels, and all the word balloons and stuff. How do you think this was done with color, though? What do you think they used for color? This was not done with computer. This was done with um, watercolor paints. Does anybody use watercolor paints at home? Sure, see? You don't have to have fancy equipment. This was done with pencils, pens, and watercolor paint. That's all there is on this. No, no fancy technology needed to make your own comic books. Here's a, this, is a, this is a different sort of book. You see that hard binding? This one comes from France. This is a comic book from France. It's about two guys that come to New York City. But we still have the same things in there. We got the panels, right? We got the gutters and the word balloons and all the color and all that stuff. Same kind of storytelling. I can't read it because I don't know how to read French. But <laughs> that's what's fun about comic books is that you get the words and the pictures working together. Like all those books out in the library that you can read, you have to use your imagination 
to tell yourself the story. But with comic books, you get the pictures and words working together to tell you the whole story. There's another thing that I think is really cool about comics. I'm going to do a little game with you guys, a guessing game. As soon as somebody thinks of what I'm drawing, I want you to just go ahead and shout it out, okay? So if you, get, if you guess what it is, go ahead and say Anybody have any ideas? Hey, you know somebody, he said it. He, said it. he has it on his shirt right there. Superman is simple. He doesn't even have to draw the S, did I? Well, I'm, <laughs> well, that's right. It does look like a gem, but that's Superman symbol, right? I didn't even have to finish it because everybody knows what Superman's symbol is. I'm going to do one more. Let's see if you can guess this one. And how quick? There you go, Batman. See, it didn't take much, did it? Because everybody Batman. knows what Batman looks like, right? His symbol. Everybody knows what those things are because Batman. everybody knows about these superheroes. I'm going to do one more, and I want you guys to see if you can get it. Uh, kind of in the way, no. I know. Star. 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 There is a star. Did anybody guess what? But what that is, is the symbol for Galaxy Man and Cosmogirl, the star. That's their star. That's their symbol, just like Batman and Superman have their symbols, right? It's on top of their, um, it's on top of their, their masks there. And it's part of their logo. That's right, very good. Now, what's my point in that is that what, what these three things have in common is that somebody thought up Batman. Somebody thought up Superman. A friend of mine, Kyle Hookhammer, thought up Galaxy Nanny Cosmic Girl. And he created the Hero Cats, too. And what's really fun about comics is that you guys can think up and create your own heroes and your own stories, too. And, you know, you can share them with the world. And it doesn't take much, as I said. All it takes is paper and pencil. And you can make your very own stories about your very own heroes. That's why comics are so fun and so cool. So I really like to draw them. Now, as I told you before, the theme is every hero has a story. So I'm going to tell you guys the story of how Galaxy Man and Cosmic Girl became Galaxy Man and Cosmic Girl. So remember, whenever I point to you guys, you're going to do what? You're going to shout out Galaxy Man or Cosmic Girl, right? Let's practice it one more time. Make sure we got it, right? Galaxy Man. Galaxy Man, boys. <laughs> Let's try one more time. All right, boys, ready? Galaxy Man. All right, girls, you ready? Cosmic Man. That's right. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story about how they came, how they became heroes. The, name, the title here is Dawn of a Hero. So, Stellar City, home to astronomer Stanley Quest. What's an astronomer? Well, out of space. See, he's got his big telescope here. He's an astronomer. He studies the stars. All right. In his university days, Stanley discovered a new comet and met his future wife, Amelia. They, after they were wed and had their daughter, Susie, Amelia led the mission to study the comet in deep space, only to go mysteriously missing. What does it say there? It says she's lost. She was lost in space. Oh, no. Shuttles were sent to find her, but without success. Stanley felt hopeless at the loss of his wife until the fateful day a meteor struck his home. Did I know what a meteor is? It's a, it's a big giant rock that hit yeah. the earth. That's right, it's a rock from outer space. Now, this is a special meteor. It says, the meteor uh, the energy from the meteor had changed Stanley. He was no longer a normal man. Does that look like something a normal man could do? No, he's stopping that truck so it doesn't hit the bus. 
the energy from the meteor had changed energy. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, see, with his newfound abilities, ready boys? With his newfound abilities, he donned the mantle of Galaxy Man. He now had the power to comb the cosmos for his lost love. See, he's headed out to Earth. He's going to look out in space to try to find his lost wife. Though Stanley now has great power, he also has great responsibility, like most of these heroes do, for his daughter Susie, and as the protector of Stellar City. Unbeknownst to Stanley, that means he didn't know, unbeknownst to Stanley, young Susie was also given power when the comet struck their home. Her most unique ability is to mask her identity from Galaxy Man with more than just the costume. So, his own daughter is his sidekick, but he doesn't know it. <clears throat> this way, she can fight crime at his side with girls as... Galaxy Girl! Instead of being sent home to bed. Because do you think her dad would want her fighting crime? Probably not. It has fallen to our heroes to protect the innocent from the likes of Dr. Rex Ross dun, 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 and Silverbeard dun, 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 and a host of nefarious ne'er do wells. <laughs> Against these foes, our heroes have many friends in their quest to keep Stellar City safe. And even a few eyes to help in the search for Amelia. This is an alien friend of theirs. He's going to help him look for Amelia. Can Stanley balance his normal life and a super superhero vigil? Will Susie ever fess up that she's Galaxy Man's sidekick? What kind of energy was in that video? And where in the universe could Amelia be? Mm. So many questions. Finding his missing wife, raising his teenage daughter, and keeping his city safe is a tall order for any man. But there's one who has the heart and the strength to see it through. He's a husband. He's a father. He's a hero. Ready, everybody? He's... Galaxy Man! So that's, this is why it is so fun to do comics, right? You see all the things that I talked about. The pencils, the writing, the inking. It all comes together to make things like this that are fun to talk about, fun stories to tell. Because that's what we all like to do. We like to listen to stories and we like to tell stories. And you can, as I said before, with a lot of practice and a lot of work, you can tell your own stories too. You don't have to have a lot of fancy stuff or computers and all that. So, there's lots of stories out there to read about. As I told you about the Hero Cats in this issue, they, they go to an underground city and they find some, some cave dwellers and they help them fight off some monsters, right? In this issue, they meet Galaxy Man and Cosmic Girl. And they fight off of a horde of space fleas. Those cats don't want those fleas from out of space. No, sir. In this issue, there's a troublemaker young man in town who gets the power to make video games come to life. So the cats have to help fight off all of those video game creatures. So lots of cool, fun stories to tell and to read about. And uh, I know that you guys have graphic novels out in the library, right? Yes, indeed. When you hear the word graphic novel, I'll tell you what that is. This is what we think of when we say comic book, right? You know, we also hear the word graphic novel. That's a lot of times just a bunch of comic books put together, or sometimes it's one big story that needs to be told all at once. So comics and graphic novels are really the same thing. And you can find those out in the library, or you can find them online or at comic shops. So there's lots of places you guys can read about these heroes. So that's all that I have for today.